Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Let me start out with this thought. As we started this whole prayer series. Prayer, prayer doesn't change everything. Say that with me. Prayer doesn't change everything. If you can just get the revelation of that, man, you'll get set free. Let me explain, because I know i got some weird faces right now looking at me. Prayer doesn't change everything, but it changes me. In other words, there are certain things that you and I have prayed for that we probably are still waiting for God to answer. There are things that you have been believing God for. You have been praying for years, whether it's for a child to come back to Christ, whether, you know, it's a specific healing for your body, and you've just been waiting for forever. And so right now at this moment, you can look at your life and say, well, prayer does not change everything, but it does change me. And so many times we, we fail to understand that just because we're praying to God doesn't necessarily mean that God is going to respond to that prayer. Because how many know that most of us have our, an agenda when we pray? Sometimes we pray outside. No, not sometimes. Most times we pray outside of God's will, and we pray permissible will. What's permissible? You have freedom of speech. You can pray whatever the heck you want. That means that you can bring the petitions all you want to heaven, but just because you're bringing petition after petition after petition to God doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to change everything that you want. But when you understand that prayer is meant to change me before it's meant to change anything in my life. And when you have that maturity and that understanding of prayer, it literally changes the whole game. It changes the whole revelation and understanding of what what it looks like when I pray to God. And and how am I praying? And what am I praying? And am I praying God's will or am I praying, you know, my thing? Am I praying kingdom stuff or am I praying thingdom stuff? What am I praying? And today, and I say all this because I believe that today in our culture, Uh, We have people that pray or their prayer life is is so focused and mostly interested in circumstances. Have you noticed that most people pray or are more interested in praying only when they're in a circumstance, when they're in trouble, when they're challenged, when when something's not going the way you want. And so we pray and and there's nothing wrong with that. So there's more interest in praying for circumstances, and there's less interest in praying for me. So we can be so uh, caught up in only praying when we're in trouble, when we're challenged, when we hit some very difficult situations. But we we are not we're not using prayer to change our life. We're we're, we're like God, change my circumstance. God, change the challenge. God, change the problem. But God is saying, okay, but when will you pray, change me? Notice when we did the Lord's Prayer. What's the Lord's Prayer? Let's see if you guys know this. Ready? One, two, three. What's the Lord's Prayer? Go. Oh, you guys are good. Cheaters. Man, we sound like the Catholic Church right now. Yeah, a lot of mumbling right now going on. Where do you see change my circumstance? When the disciples asked Jesus, teach us how to pray, Jesus didn't teach them how to pray about their circumstances, their problems, their challenges. Jesus taught them how to pray and stay focused. Number one, our Father. You start by bringing attention to God. When you first bring attention to God, you take the attention off you. When you pray and you're always praying about your circumstances, the attention is on me. So Jesus, first you put the attention on God and he starts saying, our Father who art in heaven. He, we, we begin to, to, um, to clarify, first of all, we know that we're praying to the God of heaven, right? Because today, good Lord Jesus, even Christians pray, they mix like all kinds of religions, yoga and, and, and Christ, Krishna and all kinds of stuff. And they blend it together and it's just weird, man. Christians are doing this a lot. 
No, Jesus said, let's, let's identify clearly. Who are we praying to? We're praying to the God of heaven for the people that are here on earth. That's me, right? And notice as you keep reading, he starts saying, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trust. It all has to do with change me. Deliver us from evil, right? Lead us not into temptation. And so you see that the prayer is focused on putting it on God first and then praying, God, I pray that you would create in me a clean heart. I pray that you would change me. Just think about this. When you look at statistics and stats and all that, there's so many out there. But, of course, there's one that I 100% encourage you to get always your facts, and that's Facebook. <laughs> it's because that's, that's where everybody wears their emotional sleeves, right? Think about this. When you, when you see Facebook or social media or you know anyone that's Christian, 90% or 99% of the time, you know what they do? Look at their prayer. Pray for me for a car. Pray for me for a job. Pray for my family. Pray for my kids. Pray for my health. Pray for my toe. Pray, 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 pray for my, my quinceanera. Pray, pray for my wedding. Pray for, and, and is this not true or not? And so we see everything's up. And there's nothing wrong with that. Please, don't get me wrong. But I want to draw a point here. Pray for me this. Pray for me. And everything you see on social media, and it has emojis and feelings and all that. So, you know, we're such a feely generation. And so we, we plaster all through social media, you know, pray for this. Pray for this circumstance. Pray for that accident. Pray for, and we even post pictures of us in the hospital beds. And, with, you know, and then a, an ivy going there like, have you guys seen? And I'm like, wow, man. We just wear it on our sleeves. We want everybody to know what we're going through, what we're feeling like. You know what? All right, great. You're in the hospital. Praise Jesus. But let me ask you this. When have you seen someone post a, 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 a post, a statement that said, pray for my selfishness. Pray for my lack of kindness. Pray that I would treat my family better. Pray that I would, and you finish the sentence, when have you seen an inward focus prayer request it's always outwardly focused. We live in this culture today. We live in a culture that's so outward and not inward. And if you're not careful, here's what happens. When, when you start praying like that, it's so easy to compensate your, your dysfunction, your emotional instability with Christianese. What I mean, it's Christian terminology. How you doing? Praise God. Awesome. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. And we begin to compensate it even with spiritual gift, right? Spiritual talent. That goes for all of us here because right now in this room, there is someone sitting next to, next to you that is going through a challenge, who has a problem, who has, whether it's an emotional issue. There are people here that are sitting today that have a, a very difficult circumstance and, and, and it's not easy. And so I'm not saying deny all that, but we have to bring prayer back to its focus. Because if not, you're just going to keep praying these prayers that, that, that you're waiting for a long time. And then you get disappointed because you're not seeing them come to pass. But prayer life is not meant to, to just change our circumstances. Our prayer life is meant to connect us with God, to heal the inner man the inner woman it starts with insight that's why when you look at the disciples when jesus would be hanging with them and they would fall into a storm literally he would always calm the storm within before he calmed the storm without he always started with them god wants to start with us and and not just pray you know or break the glass in case of an emergency that's not the way God wants us to pray anymore. God wants us to break that mindset. God wants, to, wants us to break that worldly culture. It is a worldly culture. Because today it's such a me generation, isn't it? It's just a me, 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 me. I, 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 I. Selfie, selfie, selfie. Sel That's the generation we live in. And what that does, it's conditioning us to not pray to God. We actually start praying to who knows? It's almost like we pray to ourselves. Because that's all we focus on is ourselves. And we draw the attention off God. And so, 
But in any state, aren't you glad that, that prayer is the source of our breakthrough? That prayer, I mean, God wants us to bring our dysfunction. He's the only one that can fix our dysfunction. He's the only one that can, that can heal the broken heart. He's the only source. He is the manufacturer of you, of me. He's the only one that can reset our soul. There is nothing else out there that can do what God can do when he is the one who created us. And so we keep trying to, to do life, to to become everything God calls us to be, but we're doing it in our own strength, in our own wisdom, in our own insight. And God's saying, hey, listen, how about you come back to me? I'm the source. I know how to fix you. And that's where we need to draw our attention back. Amen? Yeah. Because I get it. We, we all have stuff. But I'm praying that through this series that, that we would literally put a mark in our life and say, this is the series that's going to change my life. It's no longer just about change my situation. Get that out of your mind. I'm not praying for God to change my situation. I'm praying to God to change me because when God changes you, he changes the way you perceive your situation. He changes the way you, you not only perceive but how you view it, and, and, and he changes everything about it. He gives you the strength. You know, so many times we think prayer makes me better. No, prayer doesn't make you better. Prayer makes you stronger. It makes you so much stronger to go ahead and fight the battles that you're dealing with because you know what? We are all dealing with real warfare. We're dealing in a world with real darkness. We, we live in a world with major mental illnesses inside the church, outside the church, and the only one that can heal that is Jesus. Yes, fine, get your help. But at the end of the day, you have to have the, the revelation that God is the only one that can restore me. He's the only one that can redeem me. He's the only one that can change me. And until we finally come to that place of faith, it's going to be so, it's going to be a very sad life for many of us. Because we'll, we'll, we'll worship the circumstance than worship the one who can destroy the circumstance. Are you hearing me today? And so it's so important. So pray this prayer with me. Look up on the screen right here. Say this with me together, count of three. Ready? One, two, three. God, make a mark in me today for change. Give me what I can get from others in my heart and in my life. Do a work in me. Create in me a clean heart, oh God, and give me. Amen? And so we have to talk like that. And, and I, I say this. You can take a picture of it or go back and watch a uh, uh, live stream later. But the reason I say this is this. As I was thinking about this message, I was thinking, who's the perfect example of, of someone that was so inner focused? And I have preached John chapter 5 so many times, and I'm just going to take a different angle. Same story, we know. There's a man that Jesus sees who is by the pool, pools of Bethesda. So just, just think this. So there's many sick people there. And the Bible says that every time, um, every so often, maybe like once a year, an angel would come and stir the pools of the water. And if anyone jumped in that water, they were immediately healed. It was like supernatural. It was awesome, right? I mean, who want, wouldn't want to hang out in a place like that? So Jesus shows up on the scene, and he sees this guy who had been lamed, who had been paralyzed, and who had been sitting there for 38 years. Just listen to me. 38 years. And as you begin to see the story, I think it reflects maybe sometimes how some of us have been maybe in our emotional dysfunction or whether you've been in, in a trauma situation, in a challenging situation, in a circumstance that may be... It's been, maybe been a week old, five weeks old, uh, six months, a year, five years, ten years. And, and we can hate on the guy who's been sitting there for 38 years. But the reality is that in church there are so many sitting like that man who have been sitting in this pain for too long. And so we know that Jesus approaches it, approaches this man, and, and he, 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 he asks him one simple question. And the question was, do you want to be made well? Right? That's a good question. Another way to say it, he approached him and said, do you want to change? Because obviously for 38 years, the brother hasn't changed. Still in this same attitude, same mindset, same drama, same trauma, same pointing of the finger. And you'll see right now when I share it, it's the same thing. That doesn't change. Just like so many of us, we come to church and you hear a message and, and you're enlightened. Your eyes are open. You're like, man, that, that was for me. But we leave this place no different than when we first came in here. 
and then we come back the next weekend and there's still no change right we have information but we have no transformation that's the problem with the the, the culture of the church today there's we're just inundated with info 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 you know tickle me elmo tickle me elmo make me feel good make me feel good and then we leave here all hype 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 but there's no change and so Jesus shows us, because I'll give you a free coffee, a lot, whatever you want, if someone can answer this for me. And we're going to play school today, so you got to lift your hand. And I will put you in the corner. Okay, what was the definition I gave last week of prayer with a hand lifted? What's the definition I gave last weekend of prayer? What is prayer? What's the definition of prayer? Anyone? Okay, let's see. You back there. No. Yes. Good try. God communicating to you. And I know last week I had people look at me all strange, like, what? God communicated? What do you mean? It's like, I thought we communicated God. Okay, yes, we obviously do. But think about this. When you're ready to finally change, change will not happen until you confront what needs to change. Jesus confronted the man and said, do you want to be made well? And what does the man respond? He starts giving him the history of his trauma he starts telling him the whole long story of woe is me and it's not that jesus is not compassionate jesus was very clear do you want to be made well do you want to change and he started talking about how how every time he tried to get in the pool somebody would jump over him somebody would step on him somebody cheated and cut the line and and jesus was like I didn't come here to hear the history of, of why you've been here for 38 years. I came here to confront the fact that you don't want to change. And that really speaks to us because sometimes we can be sitting in church and you want change, but you won't change. But you desire to change, but you won't put in the work to change. And I believe that every single one of us have all hit a season where we don't change our attitude. We don't change our perception. We don't change the way we view things. And if not careful, we're no different than the man that's been laying there for 38 years. And so Jesus didn't ask the man, hey, do you want to feel better? No, but that's how we are in this society. We, people just want to feel better. That's why we don't change. Because, yes, today you're hearing this message and you may feel better. But do you want to be made well? We got too many Christians. I just want to feel better today. I came in a little bit oppressed. And then you leave and like, okay, I feel better. Pastor was on today. Wow. I feel so much better. But you come back and you're still the same you. I'm talking to the choir. I'm talking to me. There's some things that I got to change. There's some things that I got to confront. There's every person that's sitting next to you, behind you, in front of you. Everyone here has an area in their life that must be confronted and change must happen. If not, you'll lay there for 38 years. And there's a difference of, do you want to be made well? <laughs> and do you want to feel better? Feeling better is a band-aid. Being well is transformation. I was lost, but now I'm found. Amen? Give God a hand clap for that right there. So Jesus is trying to bring the focus. Come on. Do you want to be made well? What's the next thing that he does? It's what we all do. We start blaming people for why we're not well. Remember, he says in the story, read it, do it for homework. John chapter 5. I don't got time because um, I have other verses I want to talk about. He starts saying, I have no one to put me in the water. How many of us kind of look like that? Like, man, I, I've been... I've been betrayed. I've been lied to. I've been hurt. I've, I've been forgotten. Jesus didn't ask you, were you hurt, forgotten, were you betrayed? He didn't ask, do you want to be made well? We want to feel better. God's like, nope, I don't want to. Feeling better is not change. Do you want to be made well? And he starts talking next about, not only did he talk about his history, then he starts probably talking. And I know we don't have the whole context of the story, but I bet you he started dropping names. You know, Philip. See Philip right there? 
he's a cheater. I, got, I was here 38 years. He just got here last week. How, tell me, Jesus, how did he get up in the front line? How'd that happen, right? Oh, and look at Susie. Oh, yeah, Susie, she may look cute, but let me tell you something. There's a little, mm, you know, inside Susie. Susie's mean. And, and we're so quick to talk about what everybody else has done, and we can be so dysfunctional. And every time we pray, we have like this, this short circuit because God is saying, hey, listen, we have to come to the place of, of, of forgiving, letting go of certain things that have taken place in order for me to come and heal your land, right? He says, if my people would humble themselves and if they would just pray to me, right? God, if you would just pray to me, he says, I would heal you, right? So it's not, it's not a, 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 a question whether or not God can heal you. It's, it's a question is, will you allow God to heal you? It's your choice. It's a choice that we have to make personally. And if we don't make that choice, we will stay there for a very, very long time. And so I love this. And, and, and that's why when you think about, you know, praying, and it's, it's interesting. You can tell when people don't know how to pray. And they've been around for a minute. But that, that happens to us too. I've been up here and I've prayed some very crusty prayers before. Like I get, I get up like, what the heck? What kind of prayer was that? What's wrong with you, Mauricio? You know, you know, you know more than that. Have you ever prayed a crusty prayer? Like I have been with people, and if that's you sitting here, don't I ain't hating on you. I'm just I'm just talking real. But I've been with Christians that have been saved forever, and 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 you know, you're like, hey, can you pray for the meal and we'll be sitting? And I've had people literally just pray the most weirdest prayers. Like, like I always say, well, can we just pray for the food? I start praying for I'm not kidding. I've had people pray for animals. I'm not joking. It's not. I have people. I've said, and you're just sitting there, kind of like, what the heck is? Like, are you serious? Like, we're praying for animals. I'm about to eat this animal. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you praying for animals? I'm eating. Like, we're contradicting ourselves here, man. Should we eat it or let it live? What do you want, man? But but listen, it's so easy for us to become so crusty in our prayer life. It's not necessarily about the content. You know, it's about the heart. It's about the conviction of how we pray to God. You know, we can be, it's like when the Pharisees were always trying to look so good. And Jesus said, would you just stop with your repetitious prayers, man? They ain't even touching the ceiling right now. Stop it. And we have, without, without really understanding this, sometimes we can become so religious that we just start praying and looking crusty and religious. And, but there's no power. There's no authority. There's no dominion. And listen, please don't confuse me. You don't have to be a shouter like me to pray, okay? You don't have to do that. I have heard the most sweetest, uh, wonderful men and women who are in their 70s, 80s, and they pray with like this voice that's just so low, like you can barely hear them, right? But then they're praying, and you hear the content and, and the words, and they pierce your heart. So it's not about volume. It's about depth with God. That's prayer. It's when you finally have, have an experience with Almighty God. It's when you know Him personally. And when you speak and when you talk, it's coming from the depths and the wells of all the Word that you have filled yourself up with. And then every time you pray, you're praying God's proven and established Word. And God responds to His Word, not your opinion. Amen? And so, here's what God says about prayer. Look at Philippians chapter 4. Verse 6 through 7. I like this. It starts off with, don't worry. Look at your number and say, don't worry. This is like one of those weird scriptures that kind of like, it's an oxymoron. It really is. But it's pretty cool. It says, don't worry about anything. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Just don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I got to pay the rent. Don't worry about it, man. It's all good. <laughs> got the mortgage coming up. Ah. Don't worry about anything. And it's an oxymoron because look at this. So he's saying, don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. So in other words, it's not that you're not going to have worry. You're going to have worry, but don't worry. That's what he's saying. If not, he wouldn't say, but pray about it. Pray about everything. So it's not just. It's not just pray and break the glass in case of emergency, but he's saying pray about everything. Like let's say if you're here and you're wanting to buy a house and, and you're, you're trying to figure out 
how you want to do this process. Arrogance is do it your way, right? But asking God, like, okay, God, is this the right house? Is this the right city? Uh, is this the right plan? Is this, that is praying about everything. You know, pray about the car you're going to buy. You know, and I know that this may be weird, but let me tell you something. I think it's important that you got to start somewhere with your prayer life. You got to develop it somewhere. You know, sometimes it's okay. When I first got saved, I was praying for parking spaces. I know that's stupid. But not stupid for someone who was starting out because here's what happened. I would pray for parking spaces like, Lord, I thank you as I drive into this crazy mall. I'm going to have a parking space literally like, like 20 feet from the door. And I would pray these and I, would, and I meant it. I would cry my heart, God, thank you for this parking spot. It's going to be great. And, I, and boom, it's right there like, yes. And I'd be like, you see, God answers prayer. <laughs> right? Like, man, I'm favored of God. God does it all. Yeah. And you walk out the car. You're just like a giant, you know, and just. But let me tell you, grace lifts after a while, man. You know, that's a, good, that's a great way to start. After that, I started praying. After I developed my prayer life really good, I prayed for parking space. I don't want to get any parking spaces. Nothing. So it's not, it's not that God's favor is not on you. It's that God was willing to train you up to learn how to trust him, even with the smallest things. Pray about everything. And it trips me out when people don't, and when they don't, when they don't pray because they're like, well, you pray because you pray better, or you pray because, you know, you sound more powerful, and you pray. And so we have all these ideologies we created and it's like it's goofy because look let's finish it up he says so don't worry about anything but pray about everything and he tells us how with what thankful hearts most often we don't pray with thankful hearts we pray with grudge we pray with revenge right we pray with anger you know we pray like god let fire fall from heaven burn them all <laughs> remember remember when when the disciples are like man do you want me to pray heaven down, fire from heaven? No, Jesus like, what's wrong with you? Are you crazy? He says, no, we pray with thankful hearts. He says, with thankful hearts, offer up your and to who? Don't be that person that's in that prayer circle, right? Here, let's all get in a prayer circle. Come here, quickly, quickly, fast, fast, fast. Quick, I have to hurry. Yeah, right here, look, look. Don't be that person that's like, he says, who do you pray to? God. Who do you pray to? But here's, here's what some Christians do. They compensate for that. Like, Father, this is Ari, by the way. And so it's, let's just pretend Ari wasn't in the circle. And we're just like, Lord, we just thank you for Ari because we know she's had a bad attitude this week. <laughs> and, Lord, we don't know what she's going through. I mean, I know she just broke up with her boyfriend. Could be it. It could be that she just got fired. I don't, but Lord, we just, we lift her up to you. No, you know what that is? That's gossip. That's gossip, slander. You ain't praying to God. You just want, you, you just, you don't want to be directly slandering or gossip. You want to indirectly be slandering and gossiping. Think about it. Have we ever been in a place where you're praying for someone, but it was never to benefit them. It was to benefit you. Well, when you talk just about you, that's what you look like. That's what I look like. When I'm just so consumed with me and Mauricio's going through this and Mauricio's going, it's woe is me. God didn't give us a spirit of victim. He says, I gave you a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. And so many times, if not careful, within our own prayer, that's what we look like. Are you hearing me? And so he says, he says, then. Then, when you pray to God, then, because you belong to Christ Jesus, God will bless you with peace. Notice, he didn't say he'll bless you with whatever it is that you prayed for for a circumstance. He, peace is what you need. It's not more money. More money, more problems. Right? Boyfriend, girlfriend is not what you need. Boyfriend, girlfriend, more problems. Peace. He says peace. God will bless you with peace that no one can completely understand. Why aren't you being moved? Because I have the peace of God, man. But it's not looking good for you. It may not be looking good for me, but man, but God is with me. God is for me. I'm telling you, prayer just changes things. It changes me. It changes how I perceive. And so it says, and so that no one can completely understand. And this peace, look at this. This peace will control the way you what? Think 
and the way you what? Feel. Isn't that amazing? That when we just pray, God will come. And you're basically saying, God, take control of how I think and how I feel right now. When you don't pray, you're saying, I got this under control. Worry is saying, basically, God, I don't trust you. That's worry. If you're always worried, you're basically validating that you don't trust God. When I worry, I don't trust God. He says, don't worry about anything, but you are going to worry, but pray about every worry. Pray about it. So it's not, it's not that you're not going to worry. And, and, and listen, we got to learn how to do this. How many of you here have ever been to SeaWorld? Anyone ever been to SeaWorld? It's so cute, right? It's amazing what they can do. But just think, I was thinking this, like, how is this going to work? And I came up with this during the 8 a.m. It was like, and I was thinking, it's amazing how many people will not try to pray because they feel like they're inadequate, not good enough, not smart enough, whatever. But it's amazing how SeaWorld can train a walrus to play basketball. <laughs> but we can't train ourselves to pray. Yes or no? You, man, they can train a bird to deliver something from one end of the, of the park to the other end of the park. I mean, they can train a worm to do a circus act. You look at SeaWorld, I mean, I'm thinking, dear Lord, I'm not trying to compare us to an animal. But come on, what is wrong with us? Why can't we, why can't we learn to pray? Why can't we train to pray? Think about it. Without the prayer life, there is no more connection. When there's no more prayer life, that's when things go chaotic. That's when we drift. When you start saying things like, I don't feel God. It's not that you don't feel God. It's that you left God. Because God said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. So if God says, I'll never leave you or forsake you, then who's the one that did the leaving? We did. How did we leave? We stopped praying. And when you stop praying, you leave. You're the one that does the breakup, not God. God doesn't break up to make up. We do that. But he says, but don't worry about that either. Pray about that. Address that. And you watch how God will give you peace. Are you getting this? Yeah, we got to understand this. Because if not, you'll also begin to, uh, you know, develop these, these, uh, these prayers that are very vague -ish. Uh When my kids were, were growing up, Alexis and Isaac, and when I had to go to the supermarket, they weren't begging me for milk, cereal, and eggs. They were like, please... Dad, can you give me milk, please? Please, you, you know, no one's begging. My kids were never begging for the things that they needed in order to feed them. And how awkward would that be if our kids have to beg us to buy them food? That, that, that would be very crazy. But we treat God the Father that way. How is it that we keep begging him to do something? We beg him. We plead with him. And we've all done that, all of us here. But why would you beg for something that Jesus already bought for? Why would you beg Jesus for something he already died for? And so our prayer life is no longer a prayer life. It's a beggy life. But once you understand the word, once you understand your rights, then you're no longer praying with doubt. You're praying with god fittings and saying, no, you know what, God, this is what you said in your word. You said that you own a cattle on a thousand hills, and they all belong to you. So God of cattle, provide. Jesus, you said that it was by your stripes that I was healed, not I am healed. I was healed, past tense. And so I demand in the name of Jesus that it's by your stripes I'm whole. And, and you're not waiting to feel it because guess what? Your feelings will catch up to your faith. So you got to start with faith, feelings. They line up eventually, right? I ain't feeling, I still, I'm still coughing. That's okay. Keep coughing. But eventually that, that cough is going to have to come unto, under the alignment and the authority of Jesus Christ. It has to. But you have to have that kind of dog faith, that bulldog faith. You're like, I ain't letting go. I'm not letting go. I'm going to keep praying. When you've done all to stand, I stand there for. 
when I've prayed every prayer, I'll keep praying. Next week, I'm going to be doing uh, the 50 Shades of pray of Praying in the Spirit. I know that there's been so much, much in misinterpretation of that. Don't miss it next week because that's another shade of prayer. Today's the prayer of faith. So, so let, me, let me give you this, this, this quick point real fast. This is something that I taught on Elevate Nights, but look up on the screen. When you understand the nature of something, its behavior will never surprise you. When you understand the nature, and how many know that prayer has a nature and it has a behavior? And until you understand it, man, you'll just always kind of be like, surprise. It's kind of like this. Think about this. When, when you think of a cat, what, what sound does a cat make? Everybody. Okay, very nice. So, so, so you and I understand that. But in the spiritual sense, sometimes we want a cat to bark. Cats don't bark. Okay? What do dogs do? What do they do? Ooh, ooh, and they lick it. So we expect, so we know that cats, they hide. And if they get to love on you a little bit, man, that's a special cat. But cats tend to hide and they don't want, they're, they're like independent. I don't need you, Mr. Owner, just feed me, right? A dog is like, doesn't leave you alone, just licks you, licks you. And you expect it to bark. You expect a cat to meow. It's like your youth. If you have any teenagers, you know, you have to understand Instead of being surprised, like, why did they make this stupid decision right now? Why? How, how stupid could they be? How dumb could they be? Listen, you don't understand the nature of your youth. Youth are going to make stupid mistakes, make bad decisions. It's the nature of youth. Like it or not. If not, you're going to keep being surprised. Like, oh, I can't believe my kid did that again. So when you understand the nature of something, its behavior will never surprise you. When you understand the nature, the power, and the behavior of prayer, you'll never be surprised again. When something comes and hits you, man, you'll already have so much experience in that place of your life. That's why I love people's testimonies. Like you could be in the worst season of your life. God's not going to waste that season. In the moment, you're like, well, let God get another, you know, testimony from somebody else you know I don't want this but God will not waste any season you're in God will take that season and he'll season someone else with it that's what he does with it so when you finally have that's why you need testimonies that's why we must go through things that's why God allows it because when he allows you to go through something it's meant to be your greatest teacher it'll teach you what not to do or it'll teach you how to get through it it'll teach you how to pray and I'll tell you if you're in hell Prayer will teach you a great lesson that God has more power than whatever circumstance you're facing. But you got to understand it. When you fail to understand that, you're always surprised. You're always like, I can't believe this has happened to me. Well, you should believe it because you have an enemy. You have an adversary, and he wants to steal, kill, destroy. Did you forget what Jesus said? Are you hearing me? So when you understand the nature, you understand the behavior, and you're no longer surprise so we want to understand man it has it has the nature prayer has a nature of power it has a, it has a behavior let me show you how how it shows it here in mark chapter 11 because here's 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 the nature of prayer are you ready quickly let's get out of here we're almost done we can play music now please because that always makes you guys feel like it's already over <laughs> i got y'all well trained <laughs> okay yeah gosh is finishing yes yes I've made you perceive. <laughs> and, but it just, it just feels so much better when you hear music and the preaching, right? You watch, just listen right now. Listen. So if you read it, Mark chapter 11, it shows you the behavior. So, so don't, don't get weirded out when you see a Christian, a believer, that's not surprised when, you're, when they're telling you, like, this is what I'm going through. If you're waiting for a reaction, like, oh, my God, I'm so, Oh my God! Oh my God! What's it? and if their if their response is like, don't worry about it. This is good. this is gonna be good. God, God's gonna get us through this. That means that they understand the nature. You want people that understand the nature that you're in in the moment. You want those kind of people. But Mark chapter eleven shows us the process of that behavior and the nature of prayer. You ready? This is Jesus. He said it in the red. Ready? He says, "Have faith in." This is Jesus speaking. Let's say it again. Have faith in. This is Jesus telling his disciples, you 
need to have faith in God if you want to see the rest of this happen. He says, have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly, I tell you, every say, if, means it's an option. If you pray, if you believe, if you trust, that's, on, that's a big if, then you'll change. He says, if anyone says, and I love how he says anyone, that means anyone. Anyone can pray to God, anyone. But I've only been saved for a week. Are you an anyone? Well, yeah, then pray. Anyone if anyone says to this mountain, whatever you're facing, what's your mountain? And he says, go, throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their what? Do you see why it's not God changed my circumstance? It's God changed my what? Because once God changes your, then your circumstance will change. Why? Because your heart will tell you your circumstance is bigger than God. It will tell you that. But prayer gets your heart back in right spirit with God. Create a clean heart in me, O oh God. Place in me a steadfast spirit, O oh God. That was David's prayer. And so he says, you can say to the mountain, throw yourself into the sea, and if you don't doubt in your heart, he says, but if you believe that what they say will what happen. So it's not just about, you know, one, have faith in God. Number two, don't doubt God. And number three, it's not just believe God, but it's number four. You know what's number four? What's so crucial is you better start believing what you say. Like, and here's what I mean. I've been in so many circumstances where I walk into hospital rooms dozens and dozens of times. In people in deathbeds. And the doctors have already said to the family, your child, your son, your daughter, your father, your mother, your spouse, is, there's nothing else we can do. Let me tell you something. I may have faith, but I'm human. And just like you're challenged, I'm challenged. And when you're facing a circumstance that's so big like that, that circumstance will literally intimidate you and tell you, this ain't going to change. It's not going to change. Why? Because the doctor's already busted out the facts. That person is brain dead. Pull the plug. I've been there. And I'm having to confront the family and say, don't pull the plug. They're obviously still here on earth. Let's believe. And there's a struggle as I'm praying. Doubt starts trying to fill my heart. And then I have to overcome and I start praying, God, create in me a clean heart. Lord, break this spirit of doubt inside of me. And Father, I thank you that you're helping my unbelief right now. I believe in Jesus' name that it's by, and you see, it's not just pray, it's believe what you say. Believe. There's so many people that pray and don't even believe the, their own mouth. It's, you know, Lord, just I pray you. No, believe, authority. He says, if you tell to that mountain, go. It's got to go. Well, why isn't my mountain going anywhere? Because you don't believe what you say. So what do I do? Do what the previous verse said. Start with your doubt. How do I do that? God, forgive me for my doubt. Create in me a clean heart. Give me a steadfast spirit. I believe you, Jesus. And you listen, eventually, like the walrus, you'll be trained to play ball. You'll be a ball player. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in what? Believe that you have what? So when you, listen, you can't, it's like right now. Here's what it looks like, prayer looks like. Elevate Church, I know that my car is parked across the street and it's waiting for me today when I leave. That's in confidence, right? That's what prayer. How do I know that? Well, I parked my car there. Some people are like, oh my God, that's so deep. No, I parked my car there. I did that. 
So God's saying, I'm not asking you to pray what you think. I'm asking you to pray what I already said. God's not doubting what he already did. God already knows what he did. The question is, do you believe he already did it and he did it for you? That's the receiving end. So when you pray, believe that you have received it and then you'll have it. If you can't believe that you received it, you can't have it. And I know that's not nice. But how many know that it's not about being nice, it's about being urgent. When you pray regularly, irregular things will happen more regularly. You got to believe God for that. Last verse, we're out. Revelations 8. Now I'm going to show you the process of what happens when you pray quickly. I can knock this out in five. Ready? Revelations 8. Are you guys still here? Are you bored? Good. Revelations 8. Look at this. Please watch this. <clears throat> so you understand the whole context? When you go to Revelations, you know we're in trouble, right? So. <laughs> Just saying. Okay. So in Revelations 8, this begins to describe how, how the process of angels would go before the presence of God and how they worshiped him. And so if you read it, it's the process of what the angels do as they're going out to work. Now watch this. Another angel came and stood at the altar. Everybody say another angel. Let me just be very frank with you, okay? I know I'm Mauricio, but we'll be frank with you. Okay. Everyone here, <laughs> that was a weak joke, I know. Everyone here has an angel. Everyone here, we have an angel. Think this way. And I know that may, that's, that's too deep. Okay, it's time to grow up. Okay, we have an angel. Mary's a perfect example. Did the Lord come speak to her or did an angel come speak to her? An angel came and spoke to Mary and let her know her divine plan. Joseph, did the Lord come speak to Joseph or an angel came to speak to Joseph? An angel. You look all through Samuel. Who came to speak to Samuel? The Lord or the angel? The angel. You go, you go all through scripture, and the angel of the Lord spoke to. So we all have angels. And you're like, well, I don't have an angel. Okay, well, give me your angel. I'll take it. I need the extra angels. Another angel came, and he stood at the altar, and he had, look at this, and he had a shallow gold cup. Everybody go like this. A shallow gold cup for burning incense. When you pray, it's burning incense. When you pray, we say, when I pray, I'm burning incense. Let's keep reading. He was given a lot of incense to offer on the golden altar. And the altar was in front of the throne. With the incense, he offered the prayers. The prayers of who? Of all God's people. In Psalms, it says, and your prayers came up to me like a sweet-smelling aroma before the nostrils of God. Your prayer is incense to heaven. But let's keep reading. Look, next verse. And the smoke of the incense rose up from the angel's hand. So the angel, basically, you pray. You have your cup. You have your cup. You pass it to me. Pass it to me. Angel takes it, brings it before the altar of Almighty God, brings it to the gold altar, and he's bringing it there, and he's worshiping God, and he's giving the, the prayers of all the saints, and the prayers of God's people rose up together with it. And look, and the smoke and the prayers went up in front of God. In front of who? God. Your prayers make it to God. Stop thinking that you're just praying words. You're praying a prayer that's going to get inside the Father's ear. And then the angel took the gold cup, and he filled it with what? Fire from the altar. You know why? Because I believe that most of our prayer life is definitely going to deal with the impurities and imperfections and the dysfunctions of our life if we pray properly. And if you think about fire, when fire purifies gold, fire literally will take all of the impurities out of the gold to bring the finest gold that you could ever see. Just study that. 
So when, when God says, when you pray, don't pray just for your circumstances. Pray, prayer starts with me. Father, change my heart, oh God. And then the angel takes it, and then the angel says, here you go, Lord. And then the God the Father brings fire, and he consumes every single thing in purity, every sin, every doubt, every fear, everything that is trying to separate us from the love of God. Man, the angel handles it right there. And he says, and then he throw it down. Look at this. Then he threw it, so fire. And then he throws it down. Look, he throws it down to earth. And there were rumblings and thunder and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. So my, my question to you today is this, is what kind of prayer are you praying today? I say that today we're praying a prayer of an earthquake. God, shake the very chains of our soul. Father, shake the very cages and the prisons of our heart. Like we start praying prayers of deliverance and you watch an earthquake will literally hit your life. An earthquake will hit your heart. An earthquake will shake things out of your life that have been there for so long and before you know it, you are free. The captives shall be set free in Jesus' name. Amen? So you got to decide, am I going to pray a rumbling prayer? Come on, what's a rumbling prayer? Man, we're going to make a shout. We're going to make a rumble in this house. We're going to begin to give God a shout of praise. Give him a big hand clap of praise real quick. But a strong rumble, a strong. Now rumble your feet. I want you to just stomp your feet. Stomp your feet hard and clap. Clap. Rumble. So, so you're saying, okay, what kind of prayer am I going to bring? Man, because my prayer is going to bring an earthquake in this situation. My prayer is going to bring a rumble. I'm going to rumble my workplace, man. Things are going to change. Right? Or maybe you want to bring a lightning bolt prayer over your boss or something, you know? <laughs> to change your life, of course. So, please, church, Mauricio, elevate church. We need pray and realize that our prayer is reaching heaven and the angel of the Lord is bringing it before him as an act of worship and God is responding but God responds to his perfect will not your will be done it's thy will be done here on earth as it is in heaven amen stand to your feet if today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.